Welcome back to Round Tire Restoration, everybody. My name's Chris. Next to me here is my 1966 Triumph Spitfire. Over here that you can just barely see is my 1964 Triumph Spitfire. This one's a nice shape, that one not so much. But the problem with this one here is in my last video, the uh, can't get it to run right. I don't know what the problem is yet, so I'm gonna continue to troubleshoot down that path today. Uh, I would like to thank everybody. Lots and lots of comments on the last video, lots of words of advice and uh, ideas and all sorts of stuff. So we're gonna try to tackle some of those today. Look at the fuel system. I did get a uh, Pertronics electronic ignition module. We'll put that guy in. A couple other things we'll just try and, and see if uh, see if I can't figure out what's going on. So stick around, hopefully we'll get it fixed. Let's get it sorted. All right. So a lot of the suggestions that I got were with a fuel delivery problem. So we're gonna go ahead and check to see if we can't figure out maybe if there's something stuck in the carb or whatever. I, I don't think so, but uh, we're going to give it a shot. So we'll pull the air filters off, pull the, uh, the float bowl line off and uh, get into the top of those pistons there and, and take a look around, see if I can't figure something out with that. Got fuel right here when I pulled this off and got fuel down here when I pulled this off. So the car's been running enough that if either of these carburetors were fuel starved, I don't think that would have happened. Another thing I'll mention is that uh, these carbs, I did fully rebuild them with the, uh, the full rebuild kit. So the float valves are new. And when I say new, how many miles? I have 529 miles since I rebuilt this thing, which is sad given that it's been, this will be the third year, maybe even the fourth, since it's been on the road third, I think. So as embarrassing as it is to have spent all that time rebuilding and everything. But anyway, all that stuff is brand new, so I doubt, uh, I doubt I'm gonna have problems with sticking, sticking float valves and floats all right so this is the float assembly a uh, kind of hard to see I don't really want to take it apart but you got the little valve right here and as the fuel fills the bowl this just floats it's a nylon float and eventually it goes to the point where this thing lifts all the way up and it essentially shuts the valve so there is an adjustment for this it's got the little pivot arm and you really it's just a bending uh, thing to to make the height level right so that's that's all fine to check that and uh, did replace the float valves when I rebuilt the carbs like I had mentioned so I'm going to kind of do something a little disgusting here and I clean this brass pipe off and I'm going to blow in there and then lift the float make sure that I've got air that can go through and then when the float turns off I don't have air all right so I, I think you heard that hopefully you can tell that uh, that worked there's all this also this little vent hole right here you just kind of want to make sure that that's clear and you it does penetrate the body which you're not going to be able to see but take my little scribe in there and I can see that go through that's all nice and clear and you've got these little covers that fit over like this and just prevent from uh, you know foreign particulate and stuff like that getting in there so that one's good this one over here has got a T union because it's got to go to the, this is the front carb it's got to go to the back All right, and that's good. So no problems with the float. Again, I checked the heights. That all is good. Put that little uh, protective cover on. So that guy's good. So no, uh, definitely no smoking gun there, but I didn't really expect one. Back over the carbs, what we're gonna do now is take the, the piston bowls, lids, whatever you wanna call them, take those off here. See how that looks. Take the pistons out, check the jets and the needle, and make sure there's nothing uh, grossly wrong with that not a whole lot to these carbs are pretty simple there's like one moving part you know for the for the fuel uh, one thing 
So I'll do this. One thing you do want to do is these uh, bowls are sized essentially. So you don't want to, the piston and the bowl is, is a match set. So I, uh, way back when I, when I rebuilt these carbs, I don't even know if I did a video on it. If I did, I'll, I'll put a link, but uh, you've got to test, test the timing of the piston to make sure that it's nice and tight in there, but not too tight. And then of course you got that spring there. There's all sorts of fuel nastiness shellac in here. You also have these kind of full of, of fluid as far as um, oil for a damper fluid. So you gotta make sure that you don't, that, that kind of fits up into this here, which is part of the piston. You wanna make sure that you don't mess that up and dump oil all over the place. So we're gonna go ahead and get this off. Check this out. I don't expect anything wrong here again, but check the bottom of the jet. So let me, uh, let me get this thing apart a little bit more. Again, keeping everything situated by side here. You don't wanna mix this stuff up. So this is the piston here, and you've got your needle here. Looks in good shape, doesn't look messed up at all, or pitted, or untapered, or bent. Looks, looks, looks fine to me. Then uh, we'll look here, look inside the jet. I'll show you that here real quick. Let me get the, the camera situated. A little hard to focus down in here, but that's uh, the center portion there is, is where that needle would go in. You can see that, that hole kinda. Again, I'm sorry that it's uh, so blurry. Camera's not liking it. But anyway, that's where the, that's the jet adjustment there and you can adjust the height and all sorts of stuff. That's a relatively complicated procedure to get that thing all, uh, all set up right, but it looks okay. Not, uh, not seeing anything obvious on there. One thing I did want to ask is you can see that this, the fuel around here, I'm not real sure. I don't have a whole lot of experience with these carbs. Is it normal to find that uh, residual fuel and, and staining and stuff like that? I mean, it's not dripping. It doesn't leak when the car is running or anything, but just kind of curious on if that's uh, normal or abnormal. I'm sure I'm going to find the other thing. And, and I think I found it most times, just, just curious. All right, so nothing, uh, nothing looks extreme here. The jet moves freely. I've tried that with the choke. I'll, uh, I'll uh, you know, move to the back one here, put this one back together again so I don't confuse any parts. Move, uh, move to the back one here and see if I can find anything there. All right, carbs are back together. I didn't find any, uh, any smoking guns. The jets uh, move freely with the, uh, with the choke. I can, I can figure that out. That, uh, that seems to be adjusted fine and all that. Now, whether or not it's uh, tuned properly, that's a totally different story, but I'll uh, cross that bridge here in, in, when I come to it. But now, I wanted to point out real quick too on these air filter gaskets, you can see that these two holes down here, those are for the bolt holes. And then I know this isn't really easy to see with the angle and the light, so I apologize, but you got a hole here that actually is in the carb and then a hole here that's blanked. Same thing on the back, but the opposite side. Your air filters have the same kind of holes. So when you put the air filters back on, you wanna make sure that the two holes there are aligned to the top of the carburetor so that you can have some communication with the air filter and, and through this line. And I'm not exactly sure what this port does. I don't know if it's an equalizing line for the piston or something like that, but you just wanna make sure that when you put your air filter back on, you got it lined up properly. All right, so uh, nothing there. We'll put the air filters back on because I don't like to run the car without, a, uh, without air filters on, you, on it. I'll tell you that story someday. And we'll move on from there. I think uh, we'll look at some timing next. All right, so I've got the carbs all back together. I uh, changed out the spark plugs. I don't remember if I had mentioned that or if I, I did not do that last time. If I did say that I did do that, I uh, misspoke, but I had champions that I took out, replaced with NGKs. The NGKs uh, evidence that the, the motor was running a little rich. So I put the, the champions back in, they looked, they looked good. So that'll be something I'll worry about too with the, with the richness here. But uh, before you mess with the carbs, you really should get the thing up to speed. But anyway, I got the timing light hooked up and I, the camera angle is kind of tough here. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna promise that this is gonna show up, but uh, we'll play with the timing light a little bit. And I expect the timing to be just fine and, uh, and no problem. The, the, I have not put in the electronic ignition module yet. So full choke, car's been sitting a little while. I'm just gonna uh, turn it over here, make sure I'm out of gear, set the emergency brake, and uh, we'll just turn it over just to get it exercised a bit before we try to start it. One nice thing about a push button solenoid here, 
allows you to do that. Turn the ignition on. Alright, so at about 1400 RPM, 13 degrees is what it should be running at idle, but now at about, like I said, 1400 RPM, I'm looking at 22 degrees. So we're going to go and uh, check that against the uh, workshop manual and see what it should be. There is no vacuum advance right now, I disconnected that. Let's see. So the vacuum advance at 1400 RPM, or the centrifugal advance, if I'm reading this right, says you should be 11 to 13 degrees. So if I take 13, add 22 to it, that's nine. And it's actually a little bit slower now, so like I said, as long as I'm reading right, I assume you're adding the 13 degrees to where I'm starting, so I'm gonna add to that at 22 degrees at like it's about 1350 or so. And again, according to the workshop manual, it should be at 1300, 1200 RPM, it should be 9.4 to 11.4. And I'm at uh, nine, so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that working. All right, so the timing might just be just a tick off, but. All right, so now it's running bad again. There it goes. So whatever that kicked in right about then. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's causing that. I don't have a fuel delivery problem. It's not the plugs. Put the electronic ignition module in, I guess. Make sure I have everything here to do that, but that's the next thing. Frustrating. All right, so what we got here is the Pertronix uh, igniter. This is a model 1149 from them, a uh, Delco four-cylinder. Not uh, not real cheap. They're about 170 bucks, depending on uh, you know where you're where you're ordering it from. 180 bucks, but that's it. That, that's this is the whole kit. Not a whole lot to it. In hindsight, I could have bought a brand new distributor that's supposed to be made, made in the UK and actually pretty good quality with this Pertronix igniter in it for only about 50 dollars more than the igniter itself. So I kick myself for not doing that. All right, so not a whole lot to this kit. This is the, uh, the guts of it here. So this is what's gonna be picking up your electronic signal. And that gets uh, to essentially take the, the points out and replace it that. And then you've got some wiring and some, uh, some offsets here for actually mounting it on the distributor body. I expect this is not gonna take much time whatsoever. All right, see if there's anything good on here. 12 volt negative ground. I switched over my uh, voltage when I switched to LED lights quite a while ago. Don't use solid core spot plug wires. I don't have those. Incorrect wiring of igniter red or igniter red or black wire or leaving the key in the run position without the engine running for an extended period of time can damage the unit. I have heard that, that uh, if you leave the key on, the ignition on, and just let it sit there, that you could burn the unit out. So we won't be doing that. Four and six cylinder engines require a minimum of three ohms on the primary resistance in the ignition circuit. So that's for the coil. So I am gonna check that because I'm not positive that's a three ohm coil, I'm pretty sure. An external resistor is not required, I don't have one. So that's, uh, that's about it. So I'm gonna go grab a, uh, a ohm meter real quick and check my, my uh, coil resistance. Otherwise I might be stopping what I'm doing here and uh, we'll check it out. So it is indeed a three ohm coil, so that's good. All right, so the first step here is to remove the cap and rotor from the distributor. Make sure to not disconnect the spark plug wires from the cap. Examine the cap and rotor for rare or damage replaces needed, so they will get reused. I don't know why I can't disconnect the uh, spark plug wires, just to minimize confusion, I guess, for, for those that don't have their uh, firing orders memorized. So that's going to be easy to do. Disconnect the points wires from the terminal ignition coil while leaving all the other wires connected. Remove the points condenser and points wires. Remove the wire stud and insulator from the distributor by loosening nuts on the stud. Clean, all, clean it all up and essentially uh, put it in. All right, so I'm gonna take this over to the car now and kind of kind of go through it. Don't think this is gonna be all that tough. Kind of an extreme camera angle here. I've got it on my little tripod sitting on top of the valve cover, so this might be really close. 
so I apologize for that. But anyway, first step is to get the distributor cap off. We'll set that aside and get the rotor out of here. So that's just the two clips on the side. That's easy enough. Done this a gazillion times by now. All right, disconnect the wire from the, uh, the points wire here. It runs to the coil, so I've done that. Now we'll take a screw there and a screw there and get the points and the condenser out. Now obviously you got uh, little screws here. You don't want to drop anything in there if you can help it. All right, there is a little post in here that that arm rides up. There we go. And if you can see here, this little ground wire here, that's one thing that some people mentioned that I didn't check. So I'm going to take that ground wire out and I'm just going to take resistance of it, make sure I don't have a problem here. Just take it over to the bench, run it back and forth and move it around and try to see if I can't break it. I tell you what, I'm going to kick myself. This is it. Somebody did recommend this to me. I can't remember if it was Michael or, or someone, but forgot about it. So we'll see. All right, might not look real great, but that wire's just fine. All right, so now what we'll do here is you've got the concentric screw right there, and as you spin it, it it's concentric, so it, it runs out, in and out. So it tells you to get that lined up, and you might have to turn that quite a bit. And then we've got this guy, and that little screw right there, this is supplied with the kit, Phillips screw, that's going to go in here. Of course, I don't have a Phillips screwdriver, so I'll be right back. All right, so that's in there nice and tight. And then we're going to route the wires around, essentially, to come out through the little slot there that is originally wired up that way. So it says hold the igniter over the top of the condenser location and line up the igniter plate on the pivot pin, which is what I did, all that. Once lined up, press the plate down flat in the distributor plate and adjust the eccentric screw, which is what I told you about, until it lines it up for you. And it did. So that's pretty much now kind of locked in. That's not going to do any good. That's for setting the point gap. Install the magnet sleeve on the distributor shaft with the larger opening facing down. Slide down the sleeve to the point cam. Rotate sleeve until a slight uh, location position is felt, then press down firmly. Make sure the sleeve is fully seated. Note the part that I have comes with a spacer ring that sits on top of the magnetic sleeve once installed. Let's see what this looks like. So here's the magnetic spacer ring. And this guy here, I think, is the little sleeve that it's talking about. Yeah, this all makes sense. You probably are not going to be able to see it, but this is, if you can see, this is the, that shaft is kind of squared off a bit, and the inside of this, uh, this ring is also squared off, so. That goes down, clicks down with no problem. Then it says, saw the magnet sleeve on the distributor shaft, I did that. Rotate the sleeve until a slight location position is felt and then press down firmly and you heard it kind of click there. Make sure the sleeve is fully seated, definitely. The part number comes with a spacer ring that sits on top of the magnetic sleeve once installed. So I guess you put that in the way you like it or not, it must be for the, um, the rotor. Feed the wires through the hole. Okay, I think I'm going to take that ground wire out again and sneak those wires underneath of it. I don't know that it really matters, but just for bouncing around like that, I guess. Though I guess if I make it tight enough, yeah, I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna pop this off real quick. All right, so that makes me feel a little better. Adjust the igniter wire so they don't contact anything moving. So we've got that and give it a little bit uh, Recheck the install, making sure it's all secure and correct. Reinstall the cap on the rotor. After installing the cap, ensure the spoke ply wires are seated securely on the stripper cap. All right, so I've got, what, two extra screws. One, that screw that came out of here, and the other one, that screw that came out of condenser. So that's good. That's all I've got left. Put the cap back on. All right, nice and tight. Now, these wires that are here need to get connected to the coil, and it uses... Um, eyelets is what came with the kit instead of spade connectors, which is what I have on there, but thankfully I can use either one on this coil. And simply the red wire is going to go to the positive lead and the black wire is going to go to the negative lead, and that's it. So cut them to, uh, cut them to length here a little bit, and uh, I'll hook those up, and not a whole lot to it. I'll show you when I'm done. Got the, uh, the wires in there, looking good. 
and a little zip tie there just to keep it off the uh, cylinder head there so I don't melt anything. So the, uh, the timing now, the static timing, you really can't set it anymore because there's no way to find right your break point. So I think what I'm going to do is I will hook up the timing light and start it. I imagine that the timing can be uh, knocked off a little bit. And that 13 degrees before top dead center on your static is uh, with, the, with the static, right? So that the engine isn't rotating, it, but the, uh, the stuff picks up. I got the, still got the vacuum advance disconnected, but the, the mechanical picks up a little bit. I'll, I'll double check the workshop manual again and see where I am RPM wise and then just rotate the distributor if I have to, to pick up that same amount of timing to try to replicate as best I can. So we're gonna go ahead here and uh, hopefully she starts, we'll see. I haven't done anything except replace it, so. All right, moment of truth, see what happens. So I'm looking at like 32 degrees at 700 RPM. That's way bad. So I think we'll be able to loosen up the distributor here and uh, see what happens. I think I'm going to try a little ride here. Unfortunately, I forgot my GoPro, so I won't be able to record it. But uh, it's got up to normal operating temperature and, and ran pretty strong. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe. Uh, Maybe she'll make it. Wish me luck. Oh, that didn't work. I got uh, 100, 200 yards down the road, 3,000, between three and 4,000, and it started the just hesitation, nothing. Didn't stall, ran, ran good. We'll sit there and kind of, um, you know, gun the throttle and it'll be okay. But as soon as you put any load on it, it uh, starts to go. I sat with it, ran it up at like 3,500 and just kind of sat there with the gas pedal, trying not to move the gas pedal all at all and I was getting some uh, fluctuations that that seemed a little bit bigger than you would expect for um, you know just normal variations in the car and then uh, let off the gas a couple backfires so I, I am stumped so it's been a couple days and uh, I've been stewing and, and thinking and not really getting anywhere in my head but this is the next uh, round of diagnostic tools here Got a compression test, or I had mentioned that I was just gonna do a quick compression test. I don't think I'm gonna find anything, but it's not gonna hurt. Um, propane tanks, I'll explain that later. And then I bought a vacuum tester, so this is like 15 bucks from Harbor Freight, you know, who can't use a new toy. And I'm, I'm, that's my, uh, right now that's my go-to theory is that I have a vacuum leak somewhere and it's large enough that uh, or small enough that it doesn't really impact the car until you get up to speed but it's large enough that when you get up there it's uh, it's it's pretty shot so i'm pretty confident that the ignition is fine the uh i did get a response uh, in the interim from from a viewer that said that spring that uh that i unfortunately now have gone in and messed with looks the same way on his distributor so hopefully i didn't make it worse but i don't think i did so we're gonna uh, get all the plugs out, do a compression test real quick on all the cylinders just to look and see what those are. I don't remember what they were when I rebuilt the motor, but they were pretty good. And then uh, we'll try this vacuum test thing and just you know keep crossing our fingers. 72 hours to the car show, though the weather's not supposed to be that great. So if the weather uh, doesn't hold, I'm not taking her out in the rain anyway, but we'll see. All right, the lighting's probably gonna be crappy again. So I got, uh, got it plugged into number one. There's not really, at least in my understanding, you're not necessarily looking for an absolute number here. You're looking for more consistency across the four. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that I've read a spec that Triumph has ever put out for, for uh, pressure. So, but you know, 120 plushes. Don't want to start the motor here. Obviously I've got all the plugs pulled just to, not to prevent that, but just to ease. And uh, so the ignition's off, battery's obviously connected. So I'm just going to turn it over the starter here and then uh, see what I get. All right, and you want to roll it over enough to where you, it steadies out, and that's about, uh, oh, about 100, 100 pounds or so. So we'll write that down, relieve the pressure, and wash, winter, and repeat pretty much. All 
right? So compression is good, which is, is a relief because I don't think compression would have caused this problem and I've been really upset if my compressor is shot. But hey, good on, uh, good on me, I guess. Lucky, uh, lucky first timer for rebuilding the motor and still holding together after 500 plus miles. All right, so we'll get this out, put the spark plugs back in and start playing with this vacuum tester. This here is the crankcase breather valve, AKA Smith's valve, AKA old style PCV valve. So all it does is, this is really the first emissions control and didn't start until 1966 on these cars, at least in uh, Connecticut anyway. The um, pretty much allows the crankcase ventilation fumes to get sucked back into the intake manifold. So I wanted to check this real quick just to make sure there wasn't anything gross. It's a pretty simple, uh, Pretty simple assembly here. It does it does require servicing every 6,000 miles or so is what the, the workshop manual says. But essentially this is the body here and then you've got a spring that goes in like that. This little uh, plunger thing that goes in like that and that goes down and kind of blocks off in here. And then the rubber diaphragm goes on and it goes on one way. You could try to force it but it won't really fit real well. And then the cap goes on and then that gets all pinched off. So the crankcase is going this way, the intake manifold is going this way. So if I were to blow on this side or suck on this side, you would get airflow. If you do the opposite, you, uh, you get a little bit, but not a whole lot. Definitely it's, it's not failed, I would say. Obviously the, with the modern ones, you take them and shake them, right? I can't do that on this one because there's nothing to shake. But, so I think this thing is fine. I do want to check the hoses to make sure there's nothing uh, obvious with the hoses, but this, uh, this checks out. Never really played around with a vacuum gauge before, but from what I understand, these are kind of like black magic a little bit with these uh, older cars with carburetors and all that kind of stuff. You're supposed to be able to figure out all sorts of stuff depending on where your vacuum is doing. Unfortunately, the gauge vacuum line on the car is a little small compared to the hose that came with the kit. So I might not be able to get a real good seal here. Um, I hope it's enough, but we'll see. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. I might be able to come up with something, finagle something to be able to make it work. But so anyway, I'm going to start the car here and just see what vacuum does. I have, like I said, I have no expectations here. I have no, I don't even really know what to expect outside of, you know, the little green lines that are on the, on the uh, vacuum gauge itself. So we'll see what happens. It's just sitting here, it's got no vacuum at all. And there it stalls. So I had no vacuum at all, just sitting here. And I might have been doing that all wrong, taking it from that port there. It might not be a good spot to pull it because it's not, maybe that's where it's developing vacuum. So now I've got this kind of, not a really great rig here to see if I'm gonna develop vacuum here. This is coming off of the intake manifold port that goes to the uh, Smith's valve. So maybe, maybe this is what I should have done. Let's see what it comes up to here. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was. You can see that's, that's a lot better. Still uh, not great, so, so it says late timing. So let's play with it. better. I guess it helps if you know how to operate the machinery that you're supposed to, you know, troubleshoot with. Well, I had her out and uh, she got it further, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, once I get up to 3,500, 4,000 RPM, that, that's all, that's all she'll take. Any, try, trying to get any bit higher than that and it starts to bog down and eventually just will start to clunk a little bit. But 
you know, she pulls okay up to then, but just when you get there, there's just nothing left. So I don't know, um, I don't know what's going on there. So maybe a fuel delivery problem still at high RPM. I'm not quite sure how to test that, that I haven't already. Everything looks good. So, but, uh, so I, the car show is Sunday. I will be going regardless, unless it's pouring down rain, but, um, and it's not supposed to be real nice, but uh, I'll take some pictures and some videos maybe. We'll see. But I, again, I appreciate all the help and, and the words of advice and everything. And, and keep them coming, please. I'd ask that, you know, maybe go back and watch the other video or whatever to kind of get the full breadth of what I've looked at because I've been doing this for a little while. So there's there's a lot of things I've checked. But, uh, you know, regardless, I'll, I'll take whatever I can get. So appreciate it. Have a good rest of your night. Cheers.